So it's now my pleasure uh, <clears throat> and honor to introduce to you our uh, luncheon speaker, Greg Page. Greg is the retired chairman and chief executive of officer of Cargill Incorporated. And over the course of his 42-year career at Cargill, he held positions in the United States, Singapore, and Thailand in animal nutri nutrition, poultry processing, beef and pork processing, and financial markets. He was elected CEO in 2007. He received a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of North Dakota. And he'll be speaking to us today on a topic that I know uh, many of us have been thinking about quite a lot, water and agriculture. Greg, thanks for being with us. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, both for the introduction and for the invitation to uh, speak here today. A number of years ago, while I was still active at Cargill, the head of Cargill's public affairs in coaching me for a speech on a topic like this said, Greg, your goal is to be provocative without provoking the audience. And I will attempt to thread that needle today, but it is a topic that raises a lot of energy as we talk about it all across the state of Minnesota. But aside from everything I say, the one <clears throat> comment I'd like to make going in is that I remain incredibly optimistic that we can collectively and meaningfully address this problem. And I say that after a lot of meetings with people all across uh, the agricultural space in Minnesota. So, so why did I get engaged in this topic? And as I was approaching my retirement date uh, with Cargill, it was about the same time that the buffer strip debate was taking place in the, in the state of Minnesota. I became engaged because I was convinced that a one-size-fits-all buffer strip approach was going to be enormously expensive and unlikely to achieve the 25%, let alone the 45% goal <clears throat> that we're setting for ourselves. I felt that the quality of the debate in, was not that high, and particularly I was discomforted by the sense of the debate that people in agriculture did not care about this issue or have a shared value with all of the non-agricultural citizens of the state of Minnesota. So after 18 months of attending a lot of meetings, looking at a lot of PowerPoints with a lot of acronyms that I didn't understand, <clears throat> I came to believe, one, that the status quo is unacceptable. Second, that change will come and that the debate should simply be about how and when we're going to go about achieving the shared value and the shared goal. And third, I've always been of the belief <clears throat> that there are only three ways in which we can change people's behavior. One is compel, simply use the cudgel of regulatory legislation to force people to change their behavior. The second is we can incent people, either positively by subsidizing or providing resources uh, to pay for the change in behavior, or from the other side, to tax behaviors that we want less of. And third, and the one that I think has a lot of promise for the subject uh, that we're talking about today, is a collective voluntary response to a shared threat. So not legislation, but something where we enlist and engage all the people that are involved to pursue a shared goal, that we rely on emulation, people seeing something that works and then applying it to their farm or in their county or in, or in their crop. And then finally, to harness the competitive spirit that exists in Minnesota and agriculture between counties, between industries and segments, between the companies that market these crops and use the energy that comes from competitive spirit to accelerate the efforts to address the problem. So an example I'll give of shared, uh, voluntary collective shared action is a few years ago, we bought a lot on a lake in northern Minnesota. It's only 220 acres. I think there are 98 cabins on the lake. I don't know that my check had cleared to buy the lot. Then I received a letter from the Homeowners Association encouraging me not to plant my yard all the way down to the edge of the lake. They made it pretty clear that 
this was voluntary. It didn't feel that way. It was, it was clearly the expectation. But the shared threat is we shared a 220-acre lake that we wanted our children and grandchildren to swim in. And the only way we were going to achieve that, absent a regulatory cudgel, was shared collective response to a threat. So a couple of caveats before I go through my presentation. One, it'll become obvious that I am not an agronomist or a soil scientist or a hydrologist. So what I'm going to talk about are my own biased thoughts about how to address a wicked problem. And I am biased by watching for many years, <clears throat> both within Cargill as a big organization and watching governments around the world. At our lunch table, we were talking about agriculture in Brazil watching them wrestle with problems that don't have a clear and obvious superior answer on all dimensions, i.e. the problems involve trade-offs. So Otto During is a professor at Purdue University, and to my knowledge, adopted this language for discussing nutrient loss in, in agriculture. This is a wicked problem. So what's a wicked problem? It's the kind of problem that doesn't lend itself to a discussion amongst people that only have narrow and vehement opinions. Second, it's the kind of problem that has trade-offs. They generally have the trade-offs that a significant portion of the potential cost of addressing the problem is borne by a few, and the benefits of addressing that issue are millions. Third, it's the kind of problem with significant uncertainty. There is science, yes, but there are a lot of variables and significant variables that affect the discussion and the implementation of solutions. In this case, weather, soil types, topography, cropping choices. And so the, comp the problem is made more wicked by the degree of uncertainty. Next is the difficulty of quantification, to have a precise answer of the cost and, and the benefit. Fourth, it's the kind of problem that has intergenerational benefits, but many of the costs are immediate. And finally, they're generally the kinds of problems where yielding to the temptation to implement a one-size-fits-all policy is ill-advised. The graphic I have put up is the product of a question I was asked at a meeting where I was talking about the global food system. And at the end of my talk, the first person to ask a question in the Q&A session essentially said, you're such a smart aleck, what's the perfect food system? And I was speechless that I hadn't thought about it that way. And over the ensuing months, spent time thinking about it, and clearly the global food system itself is a wicked problem in the sense there is no righteous answer that is beneficial on all dimensions. There are simply trade-offs, and in those trade-offs requires compromise and discussion amongst the various parties. So no uniquely superior course of action in whatever you choose is going to involve a different set of outcomes and a different set of trade-offs. And so the example I use in the food system is cage-free eggs. Okay, cage-free eggs. Many people have made that choice. I could ask for a show of hands, and my guess is a large number of hands would go up. From an animal welfare perspective, a potential positive. From an affordability standpoint, a definite negative from a greenhouse gas standpoint, a de definite negative from the amount of water required to run that system versus a historically more traditional system, negative. The impact on deforestation as the result of requiring more feed for a given amount of eggs is negative, and the working conditions for the employees that work in, in those <clears throat> husbandry venues is negative. So a positive for animal welfare but the impact on other dimensions of the total global food system, negative. And we could do the same thing for antibiotics, and certainly in the case of nutrient loss in agriculture into our uh, rivers and streams, at the top of the circle you can see nutrient loss, fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. 
potential negative impacts for rural communities, for farmers' incomes, for food affordability, and even the potential to impact farm size. So the trade-offs are real and they're immediate. The costs fall on small number and the benefits accrue to a huge number of people. The one certainty I've come to believe about agriculture where there is no ambiguity is this simple equation, demand. The global food demand is determined by population and the income per capita of each individual demographic across the globe. And so agriculture does not create demand. Agriculture simply serves the demand that's presented to it. So in any given year, there is a global quantity of calories and grams of protein, et cetera, that agriculture is called upon to provide. If you divide that given demand by yield of necessity, you will determine the number of acres that are going to have to be drawn into production. And so with that, the realization needs to come as we make choices that lower yields, we need to understand that trees will die somewhere because this land will be drawn into production. Further sobering our thinking about this as we think about the impact of trade-offs and on yield is in 42 years of travel, my observation was that by and large the world farmed the right land first. And so as we reduce the yields in the right land, the amount of marginal land that we will draw into production is some multiple of that because by definition it's marginal land it was farmed last for a reason and a very good reason and the fact due to lower yields we need to draw that land into production has negative consequences for the global environment. So we have at least three sweats to three, <laughs> three threats, I can say that quickly. Three threats to progress on action to address our wicked problem of improving water quality while sustaining yields and rural communities and farmer incomes. One of the threats is our single uh, constituency advocates. Again, we have to debate a wicked problem and we need people that can enter into a compromising conversation or a, comp <coughs> a conversation of compromise. Second, there are in many of the forums that I've attended limited awareness of the trade-offs and importantly an unwillingness sometimes to quantify the dimensions of those trade-offs. And finally, the cost of the alternatives and the relative cost to other choices. And so to illuminate that comment about costs of alternatives, in June of 2013 William Lazarus put out uh, a document and it included best estimate I'm sure based on significant scientific effort of the cost per pound to remove a pound of nitrogen from our water using a variety of best management practices or approaches. So taking perennials and converting marginal lands of row crop, marginal row crop land to perennials, the cost was $38 a pound. Riparian buffers and again, converting row crop land to perennials, about $42 a pound. And the highest one listed was cover crops, $49 per pound of nitrogen removed. By comparison, his same work showed that the cost to do it by changing from a fall fertilizer regime to uh, uh, planting, uh, fertilizing at planting and followed by side dressing, a dollar and 41 cents a pound, one thirtieth the amount of using cover crops. And the second to use bioreactors, about $14 a pound. So I think as a state of Minnesota, as we take a finite amount of resources to address a wicked and serious problem that must and can be addressed, we have to think about the choices and the alternatives that we're going to choose. An example at the far end of this, and it's less current today, but in January of 2017, a program was announced, $500 million project, two-thirds roughly financed by the federal government and one-third by the state of Minnesota to take land out of production. The estimated number was they would take 60,000 acres of land in Minnesota, convert it to perennials, create more habitat and a host of, of very good 
uh, outcomes of making this choice. But to put that in context, 60,000 acres is one-third of 1% 1 of the land that's farmed in Minnesota. And assuming we were wise enough to pick and remove the most dangerous from the standpoint of nutrient loss, land out of production, let's assume we can find land that's three times as dangerous as the Minnesota average in terms of nutrient loss. We would then remove 1%. And again, our first milestone goal is to remove 25%. So $500 million to get rid of 1% of our nutrient loss. So you multiply that times 25 billions and billions of dollars if that was to be the solution for the challenge that we face. And so as we think about a menu of prescriptions for correcting this problem, I think we need to be mindful of the costs of alternatives and to organize our spending in light of that. Just quickly through two graphics that have shown up uh, recently. One is a graphic that was used in the governor's water summits that have taken place all around the state that really highlight why in Minnesota in particular that a one-size-fits-all solution is, is not right for us. You can see the areas of the state that have significant risk, and at the same time, you can see areas that have far less. And the risk we would have with one-size-fits-all is that we'd spend too much in some areas, and clearly we'd be spending too, middle, too little in some of the areas that have great opportunities for improved performance. More broadly, in the whole, Red River, or the whole <clears throat> Mississippi River Basin, the Department of Agriculture conducted a study on the conservation effects assessment. And they published their results recently. So this is in the entire Mississippi River Basin, of which clearly we're an important part from an agricultural standpoint. Their research showed that farmers had installed structural practices for controlling water-related erosion on 45% of all cropped acres in the region. They went on to say 40% of the region's farmland Growers had already taken enough steps to reduce runoff and boost soil health. Okay. So 40% farmers have taken action, in some cases the topography that they were farming and the geology that they were farming clearly helped them, but 40% of the land was behaving on those dimensions in a way that would help us meet our goal. So what's the other side of that question in the study? they found that 47% of the acres had serious shortcomings. Given that 70% of the nutrients in the Mississippi River have agriculture as their origin, we have a challenge that we need to address, but we need to be incredibly mindful of where to address it and which practices to use. And this is a Minnesota Department of Agriculture map that again highlights the localized nature of our greatest risks. So again, showing the most vulnerable groundwater. This is a formula for change that was shared with me many years ago and I used often um, within Cargill and I think others in Cargill used it as well. So I take no authorship from this, but I think the principles of thinking about change in this manner are useful to the discussion about the wicked problem of water quality. So the D is dissatisfaction. So if we get mad enough, things will change. How many people are supporters? Anger is a great change agent. Clearly some dissatisfaction is required to energize things, but there is a limit. And again, remember this is multiplied by. The second is the vision. Where are we taking ourselves? Where are we taking the people whose behavior will have to change? So I think of it as the end of the movie. Before you get me to change my behavior, I need not to know what I have to do tomorrow, but the longer-term vision of where you're taking me and what I have to do. <clears throat> the FS is the quality of the first steps. Are the first things we do practical, actionable? If we did a lot of those first steps, would it make a meaningful progress possible against our goal? So it's a very pragmatic judgment. Are we doing the right things first? So that, the outcome of that portion of the equation has to be greater than the R, the resistance to change. But the resistance to change is divided by trust. 
So if trust is complete, it's one, it doesn't change the resistance. But if there's a lack of trust, it turbocharges the resistance. And what some people would see as a highly resistant agriculture to making changes, in many cases, in my opinion, is a lack of trust which turbocharges resistance. And as we think about how to get moving more aggressively on this problem in Minnesota, to not address the trust issue is a mistake. And I think there's huge opportunity to accelerate our progress if we think well about how to build trust within uh, the agricultural community. So deciding. I mentioned that I've attended over the 18 months that I was initially becoming involved a lot of sessions and basically the extremes of the debate that I could hear were voices that said we want pristine water and implicitly the comments they were making were that we need to go back to perennials. At the other end of the uh, equation or the discussion framework in many of these groups were farmers who said, I bought this land, I paid for it, I have title to it, and I should be allowed to farm as I darn well please. So those are the extremes. I think anybody that wants to work on this problem surely realizes that neither of those views is going to prevail. And so what we're all doing collectively as a, as a Minnesota economy and a Minnesota society is deciding where to put our X. When we do that, we have to explain to both sides of where that X is positioned, why what they wanted wasn't done, and, and what trade-offs were considered before we made that decision collectively of where we were going to be between all perennials and each person f farming as they wished. Clearly, we're not behaving farming as we wish today because there are so many good practices happening all over the state. So the admonition for leaders of this effort is whenever your ex is out in the middle that you should prepare yourself to be shot in the chest and the back at the same time. <laughs> and since you're all here, I presume you are all in one fashion or another intending to be a leader on, on this issue. The second thing <clears throat> that in regard to deciding and, and holding a higher quality debate and discussion on this topic is the importance of quantification and the exponentially greater expense of seeking perfection. And I'll use Cargill as an example that we had operated at one time, this goes back quite a while ago, where our discharge requirements were for a given element in our wastewater was 15 parts per million. <clears throat> the state lowered it to 10. And we made, and nor did our competitors in our industry, made no effort to oppose that because we were along the flat part of the line. Going from 15 parts per million to only 10 parts per million was manageable with the technology we had or was going to be available. And so we raised no objection. So somebody thought, wow, industry was happy going from 15 to 10. Surely they'll be really happy going from 10 to 7. We went crazy in turn from a lobbying standpoint and because the cost to go from 15 to 10 and achieve a 33% improvement in, in our water discharge quality was something doable in the time frame and the technology we had. But as they put us out on the bend of the curve, you're suddenly spending an enormous amount of money for an incrementally smaller, smaller gain. And I hope that makes sense. The other great example I think of is sulfur dioxide. If the sulfur dioxide standard was zero, we wouldn't have electricity we could afford. But instead, we picked a level that was achievable with the technology we had. We dramatically reduced acid rain, and we can still buy electricity. I think on this water issue, we need to keep the same concept of the curvilinear nature of seeking perfection. In the first slide, one of the things that I pointed out was three ways you can compel people to do something, you can incentivize people, and the third is to change behavior through collective voluntary action in response to a threat or to, to a problem. 
There is a group of people working in the state to try to create a farmer-led and farmer-controlled database of agronomic practices. Today, if you asked how many acres are full precision farmed in Minnesota, people will turn up their palms, make a guess what percent of our land has fall application fertilizer, what percent has frozen ground application. So we do not have a database that would allow us to tell the citizens of Minnesota, one, where we are now, which would also show that a lot of positive things are being done already. Second, it doesn't allow us to demonstrate progress as year to year we use this database to show that farmers do care about this. They're buying the equipment and spending the time to address this problem, and you could do it in a documented way that should build credibility between rural Minnesota and the consumers of water and recreation. And third, we'd have the chance to harness the power of that competitive spirit that we talked about previously. And finally, you'd have the chance through emulation to show things that work and to get neighbors and people in adjoining counties to emulate practices that have been proven in their kind of geology on their kinds of crops. And so the output of this effort would be an annual report to all the citizens of Minnesota, which would be a census of agronomic behaviors and practices all across the state. And I think that evidence would go a long way towards building the collaboration and the awareness that one size doesn't fit all because the menu of practices that we would seek to document in, in this report would probably be in the 20s. And it would show the nuance that's required to do this, i.e. meet the 25% reduction first milestone and to do it in the most economic fashion. S sorry. So this was the effort I was, I was talking about in terms of what, what are the principles of the effort being made for a farmer-led database. And the last one I'll close with this is we all have a, a role in the quality of the waters that we have. How many people still use a rotary fertilizer spreader? How many of you manage to keep all the fertilizer off your sidewalk and driveway? <laughs> Only one. <laughs> I think the, the people at Scott's or Toro would like to talk with you. <laughs> The, the key point is no, no raindrop is responsible for this. No single farmer, no single consumer, no single golf course operator, but collectively we all can make a contribution to a goal that will be important to each of us and to our children. So with that, thank you. I'd be glad to take any questions. So first question is here. There is a tension between rural and urban communities across all aspects of society. Rural ag and urban environmentalist conflict, conflicts are only symptoms of a larger problem. How do we bridge this divide? It's kind of unfair in a group of 700 people to <laughs> ask a clarifying question, but the larger problem if I had to guess what the larger problem they're talking about is trust between institutions and trust between segments, whether it's all of our trust of the people that have our credit data, whatever it is. And so I think, to me, the key, there are a couple key th ways to think about trust. One is transparency, that people tend to trust things less that they know less about. And it's why I happen to be this advocate of this database is in the absence of having good information to share broadly with people about what's actually occurring on our farmland, why should they trust us? How could we demonstrate that we actually are sharing a value with them and changing our behavior? I think the second part of trust as the bigger problem is, do people feel that the people working on this problem are sincere? They're trying to do the right thing, not simply punish one segment of an economy or a society versus another. Are they competent to carry out the work that we've entrusted to them? Are they going to be able to make the nuanced rules to be situational in a geologically diverse state like Minnesota? And the, the second, are, are they sincere? And I think it's really important that this not be seen as an attempt to punish a given segment of the economy for reasons unrelated to the specific problem that we're, that we're working on. And clearly there are issues of 
concern to consumers about how large are our farms, what behaviors beyond water quality management are they undertaking that we either agree with or don't agree with. And so the ag-urban divide in the absence of more transparency. The challenge with transparency is it requires an investment of time and sincere inquiry and curiosity by those who are going to learn about it. So agriculture could print all the information in the world, and if there is not uptake on the part of the people whose opinions we're attempting either to shape or to change, we won't make much progress. All right, next question. We need programs of major ag purchasers paying price premiums to farmers that have water quality measures on their land. Does Cargill have such a program in place? And if not, why not? Okay, so I'm retired. <laughs> but Cargill is a participant, I should say. When I was there and knew, and I presume there's even more of them now, that clearly the people that Cargill sells its ingredients to, so Cargill really takes raw commodities, converts them into the food ingredients that shape many of the products that, that people buy on the shelves. The people that own the brands that use the ingredients that we sell care deeply about the way in which we farm. One example in the way Cargill runs its facilities Walmart has taken a vow and given everything else they take a vow on, I expect that they plan to achieve it is to reduce the greenhouse gas footprint, and I don't know the exact time frame, of their supply chain by one billion tons of greenhouse gases. Clearly, they then share that vow with Cargill and other <laughs> suppliers of meat, poultry, and other products to them, and we in turn then have to work with the farmers in our supply chain. So we have a number of programs where money is being put into the supply chain by the big branded food companies and retailers, and we in turn share that back through the system to get food for these companies where they can make a claim or a story around their food that reflects that changed behavior. So the answer is yes. 40% of U.S. corn is used for biofuel, which doesn't provide much benefit in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. How does that fit into your equation relating food demand to acres farmed? Yep. It's a fair question. So rather than give a really robust answer, I'll nitpick the question. Is that all right? No. We use five billion bushels of corn to produce ethanol. In some years, it's 30% of how much corn we raise. In some years, it's even more. And so it's the fact that our corn usage for ethanol is a mandated amount. The use of percentages actually hides one of the big issues of having a program that's more reflective of the weather that we've had for a given year and what the world is asking us to grow on our acres uh, in response to the, the needs of our customers. So one's the rigidity. To the issue, what's great is the question acknowledges, and I believe deeply, particularly rain-fed corn production in the Midwest where the fuel is consumed in the region. When you consider the value of the byproducts that are produced, the distiller's grains, the corn gluten feed, the corn oil that come out of it is, I would say, more then marginally or whatever doesn't provide much benefit. I think the actual greenhouse gas footprint of it considered that way. If you're using deep aquifer water in areas where the products have to be shipped a long distance, the assertion that there's a de minimis benefit to greenhouse gas. Back to global food security, um, clearly it does raise the demand for farmed acres since, again, Agriculture is given a fixed amount of demand for food. We're now raising food, we're raising crops, not just for food, but for fuel. And so by definition, that is correct, that there is more land farmed as a result of the fixed demand for biofuels that is part of the current legislation, not just in the U.S., but in more countries. And not to turn into an economic wonk, but 
What's been remarkable the last five years is agricultural commodity prices have plummeted. The number of third world countries, third world countries that have implemented biofuels requirements as a way to try to sustain their farmers through a period of low global prices is impressive. It started out as a first world issue. The US and basically Western Europe had economies big enough and strong enough and agriculture technologically sophisticated enough to respond to it. But now it's become a third world tool of rural farm support. And with that, further impact on the number of acres being pulled into production. Of votes get is that on my answer or <laughs> <laughs> the number of people voting to have that question asked to you okay so, uh, and the numbers I think keep rising as we keep going for all the questions but anyway uh, do you think ag should be exempt from regulation under the Clean Water Act the USA tried voluntary wastewater control before clean the Clean Water Act and it didn't work the cudgel of regulations was ultimately needed. This is a really good audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what Jeff said when he invited me. <laughs> but I don't know enough about each and every chapter of the Clean Water Act to say it. I'll refer back to the comments I made. This is an outdoor sport. There is a lot of variabilities that don't exist for source point polluters like, like a Cargill where we have a very easy way as a society to measure the efficacy of the work that we do before we return water to the public. And, and so to just say that the Clean Water Act was written contemplating the needs of agriculture, I'd be deeply suspicious of it because I think it was written more than 30 years ago and I don't know that it particularly envisioned that agriculture would be one of the regulated industries. So my answer would be, I think that's not the way to go, but to specifically have regulation around agricultural uh, nutrient loss. I would hope that we can go a long way and believe and continue to advocate for collective voluntary action against the threat before we have to turn to the cudgel. I think it builds trust. I think it gets more people engaged and it's more likely to have the public think of the farm community as aligned with their interests. If all any industry can say to their customers is we follow the law, that's not exactly a differentiating brand claim. <laughs> You should buy from us, we follow the law. Where if you could come out and say, we collectively share a value around water quality and we have invested this many hundreds of millions of dollars in the farm machinery to farm differently and in the practices that we need and in conjunction with scientific uh, resources like the University of Minnesota that we have implemented, I think we win twice. The water gets cleaner and the relationship between urban Minnesota and rural Minnesota gets better. So a cudgel may happen, but I think it would be an enormous victory for the food industry if we could do this without it. What are the high priority questions or challenges in rural water quality that you think need to be the focus of research and innovation? I really don't think that I'm the best person there. I've seen a little bit of the agenda for this session and there are people that are out working on it. I read a lot of the farm magazines that I think many of you in this room probably read and the debates about things like cover crops are most interesting. Yesterday, I had my mind shaped by <clears throat> a person from South Dakota State University that made a compelling case at a Pheasants Forever meeting that in South Dakota, they would have cleaner water if they had more cattle, because if they had more cattle, there would be better economics for cover crops. And if they have better economics for cover crops, they think they'll both build carbon in their soil, improve the water retention capacity of their soil, and thereby improve their nutrient loss situation. Kind of a, a triple win, but incredibly counterintuitive. There's probably somebody in this room that would argue with that assertion being that they're from South Dakota and you're not. 
But the point I'm making is there are a lot of people out there trying to think about this problem in ever more creative ways. So the answer to this, I don't know all the priority questions, but people in this room do, and I think a lot of money is being spent against, spent against that. I also think it's really incredibly important to have great research if we're going to enlist farmers at a faster speed. It's too expensive in agriculture today, especially with the prices for farmers to be doing the research on their own farms. All right, we're getting uh, close to the end of our time, so this is the last question. Promoting voluntary behavior change will require a different set of tools than we are used to using. Uh, could you give some examples? I actually think there, there are tools that we do use in our communities that if you look at the charitable nature of Minnesota, that one element of that is peer pressure. If you live in a community where all your neighbors are supporting some important cause in your community, you're more likely to join than if you live in a community where it seems that a huge percentage of the people are indifferent to the problem. So I actually think some of the behaviors that are at the core of Minnesota or, Mid or Midwest cultures are very useful for this. There's a curiosity. If we see things that work, we're likely to adapt them. If we have things that work in our farm, we don't keep it a secret. We realize that we share an industry, and that industry shares a reputation with our customers, and so we're willing to take a good idea and make it available to, to our neighbors. If we had a few minutes, we could go through a long list of inherent behavioral traits that people would ascribe to Minnesotans, and particularly Minnesota farmers. I think we have all the attitudinal uh, skill sets or mindsets that are required to do this. We just need to use them to address this problem. All right, and with that, Greg, I want to thank you for your time and sharing your ideas with us and engaging in some dialogue. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>